calculated risk. Nothing personal word of the day. It's Monday. Hope everyone had a smashing weekend. Calculated risk. When you run a baseball team and you are trying to win a World Series, all regular season preparations, discussions, and plans are thrown out the window. It doesn't mean that you fly by the seat of your pants when you're in a playoff series. It means you plan it the way you would plan a series during the regular season, except you are doing things at the end of a season you would not do at the beginning of a season as it relates to your players. Mostly I'm talking about pitching. The problem with October baseball has always been that while to me pitching, and I can prove this is so, pitching, defense, speed are the three best components needed to win a World Series, to give yourself the best chance. You know luck is required. Balls have to be hit in the right place. A double play ground ball can turn into a two-run single just by having it be five inches one way or another of the defender. So we know all of that. Calculated risk is when you ask your pitchers to do things during the postseason that their arms are not used to doing at all during the regular season. I spend minutes talking on CBS Sports HQ about starting pitching and the fact that they end up being relievers in the postseason. And the reason why starting pitchers end up as relievers during the postseason is that middle relievers are generally your least important members of a postseason roster. During a regular season, you need them to take up innings. You need them in case the starting pitcher gets pulled in the fifth, in case of injury, in case of fatigue, because you don't want to pitch your main leverage relievers three days in a row. There's a card that the manager has at the beginning of every game, which lists when the last time every pitcher pitched, how many pitches that pitcher pitched, how many of those pitches were in quote unquote stressful leverage situations. And then we go through that piece of paper. It's it's a sort of laminated uh, uh, square. It looks like your vaccine card, actually. And we'll go through with the manager on a regular Tuesday in June. All right, we're staying away from these three guys. Just make it work. Whatever you have to do, you have to do. Oftentimes, a position player will be discussed as in the depth chart of pitching. So that's regular season. But postseason, when you are scripting out your pitching, you know very well that your starting pitchers are available to you because in between starts, you are going to let them throw instead of a side bullpen, which they all throw, you're going to let them throw that bullpen during a game and during a game that matters. And during a time of the game that matters, you've seen it for 20 years, but for whatever reason this year, the Dodgers are getting crucified. And I'm not one to say that, I'm a big fan of the Dodgers. You know my view of what they are financially and the impact it had on us running the Marlins and on 15 teams in the way they're run. The way the Dodgers act has a negative connotation, has a negative result in what we all try to do. So, Max Scherzer. We are talking about one of the top trade deadline acquisitions of all time. What he did for the Dodgers during the regular season is what helped them stay with the San Francisco Giants. However, the Dodgers won 106 games. The Giants win 107. Even with Max Scherzer never losing a start as a member of the Dodgers post-deadline. Even with Trey Turner acquired in the same deal winning the batting title and being, frankly, their best player after the deadline. So their two best players were acquired by Andrew Friedman. They still could not win the division, which is absolutely insane to me. So they have to play the wild card game. They have to beat the St. Louis Cardinals. Then they get into a five game match to the death with the San Francisco Giants. You can't worry about the league championship series when you're in the league division series. You can't worry about the league division series when you're trying to win a one game playoff. Every pitcher is available to pitch when it's a win or die game, an elimination game. So during the course of the five games against the Giants, it became very clear that game five, which was the deciding game, Max Scherzer was going to have to pitch. The Giant, the Dodgers tried to say he's not available. 
hoping the Giants would believe that. The Giants didn't believe it. He was available in the beginning of that game, as you may recall, but it was feels like a year ago, when Blake Trinan got in the game. We knew what that meant, which is Scherzer was going to be there at the end. And guess what? Max Scherzer pitched in that game five. No problem. They win. It's totally worth it. The calculated risk of pitching Max Scherzer, who's going to be a free agent, by the way. Side note, you've heard me talk about when we have pitchers who are going to be free agents, who who we know are not going to be on the team. We're going to pitch them until their arm falls off. The only people protecting the pitchers who are impending free agents or not in the plans of a team is the pitcher's agent. Sometimes that pitcher's agent will have influence on the team. You've heard me talk about the influence that Boras had on Jose as an example. So that does exist. If you are going to keep your player long term or sign that player or tender that player a contract if he's in his second or third year, you are going to be far more careful. That is at least the plan that you have going into the playoffs. But then as a front office GM or president, you can smell the World Series. You can write your legacy in your head. You can think about the accolades, the money, and all the lifetime savories that come with winning a World Series. Not with making the LDS, not with making the LCS, not by losing in the World Series, by winning the World Series. That's it. You know my view. There's winning and then there's everybody else. It does not matter. The Dodgers are failures this year. On CBS Sports HQ, by the way, I said the Red Sox had a successful season because on CBS Sports HQ, you have to be a little more buttoned up and give some analysis in the minds of everyone in the Red Sox organization, it was a missed opportunity. In the minds of the Dodgers organization, it is despondency beyond repair because their ego said to you, they are going to win the World Series. They are going to be the first team to repeat since the 98 to 2000 Yankees. They were obsessed by it. And so when you can smell it, all other brain activity ceases. All rationale is out the window and you are win today mode. There is no looking forward in October. You need to win that day's game. So Max Scherzer helps them win game five. You can't worry about the championship series against the Braves if you don't win the game five, quite obviously. So the Dodgers get through game five. Then Scherzer pitches game two has a mediocre start and says, I have dead arm. And that's it. Everyone's on Dave Roberts as though he had committed the cardinal sin of overpitching Max Scherzer. Here's a little newsflash. Dave Roberts did nothing wrong. Andrew Friedman did nothing wrong. Max Scherzer got dead arm because it happens. You then take him out with 70 pitches, which they did, and you get him ready for game six. The Dodgers force a game six against the Braves, being down three to one. The Dodgers clubhouse is saying, we've got this. We came back from 3-1 last year against this same team. This same team, the Braves, doesn't even have Acuna. It doesn't even have Ozuna. We've got this. They win game five with Chris Taylor hitting three home runs. And everyone is thinking, look out, here come the Dodgers. Then we wake up on, I don't know what morning. (laughs) I assume it could have been Friday morning or Saturday morning. And we get the announcement that Max Scherzer is unavailable to pitch game six. And the world went into a frenzy. How dare you? What are you going to do now? I said, you're going to start Tony Gonsolin. You're going to have a bullpen game. But instead, the Dodgers did exactly what you would expect them to do when they're doing exactly what I say every team does. They started Walker Bueller in game six on short rest, second time this postseason. And this is a guy who is in their future. He's not a free agent to be like Max Scherzer. It is so unbelievably irresponsible to start Walker Bueller that many times on short rest, especially when you don't think that he's going to be effective, which he wasn't in game six, which caused the Dodgers in part to lose the game, which they lost on Saturday night. 
But after the Dodgers got eliminated by the Braves, all of the Monday morning quarterbacks started calling out what the Dodgers had done with their pitching. Then they leaked the fact that Max Scherzer would have been available for a game seven. They leaked that because they wanted everyone to realize two things. Two parties actually leaked that, neither of whom is the Dodgers. Max Scherzer and Scott Boris. Max Scherzer's agent is Scott Boris. Max Scherzer is going to be a free agent. Max Scherzer cannot go into free agency when he's looking for a four-year deal at 30 plus per year with a dead arm, with the possibility that there's an injury. So it had to be that Max Scherzer just needed a day. And Max Scherzer said that. I'm good. I need a day. I'm ready for seven. Well, we'll never know. So it's an easy take to say that Max Scherzer would not have been ready for seven because his agent would not have let him pitch if he were not completely ready to go. Because if you're not, you risk injury. I'm going to put a bow on the Dodgers season. An absolute abject disaster. Signing Bauer was only the start of it. Having Kershaw to those extra years of deals when he's less effective and more injury prone, not good. Resigning Justin Turner for his emotionality, overrated. Trading for Trey Turner, positive. They've got so many decisions to make in this offseason, but they've got the money to do it. They are not going to run it back. You will not see Kershaw and Scherzer and Turner and Seeger, their shortstop, the MVP of last year's LCS and World Series, one of the five shortstops minimum going to free agency. Just you wait. They'll spend their money, but it will not be the same team. Calculated risk was the word of the day. Every team does it. Every team should do it. But the Atlanta Braves are going to the World Series. The Atlanta Braves, the 88-win Atlanta Braves, the same team that did not have its number one starter all year. They lost their entire outfield to injury. They had to do a bunch of trades at the deadline. Who would have thought that the Atlanta Braves had a chance to win the World Series? There's going to be an upset in the National League. The Dodgers will not repeat. It's going to be the Braves. When you look at the Braves and they have Freed, they have Soroka, they have Anderson, they've got Freeman anchoring a lineup with Albies and Ozuna and Acuna and Darno and on and on. Braves, Yankees in the World Series. Who's my World Series pick on your marks? Get set. The Atlanta Braves. Freddie Freeman will win a World Series for the first time in his career. That was March 31st, folks. On March 31st, the day that this regular season started for 2021, I had the Braves going to the World Series and winning the World Series over the Yankees. Now, of course, I mentioned a few names that had nothing to do with their season. I had no idea of the great trades that Alex Anthopoulos would make bringing in Rosario, the LCS MVP. But that doesn't matter. If you put a futures bet on the Braves at that point, you are ready to hedge. You are ready to make some serious money. Couldn't be happier for Freddie Freeman, one of the top five nice people in Major League Baseball. Now, of course, I did change my pick, and many of you pointed that out on Twitter at David P. Sampson, that when the postseason started, I had the Brewers winning the pennant and beating the Rays or the Rays beating the Brewers. But it doesn't matter. That was wrong. I was right back in March. So what's going on today? It's an off day. Today is October 25th. Do you know the schedule is so different? 18 years ago today, the Florida Marlins won the World Series. Happy 18th anniversary to Derek Lee and Mike Lowell and Jeff Conine and Miguel Cabrera and Dontrell Willis and Luis Castillo and Juan Pierre and Pudge Rodriguez and Brad Penny and Carl Pavano and Uget Therbina and Braden Looper and Chad Fox. What a slider Chad Fox had. When we acquired Chad Fox in 03, he, was, he would throw his fastball 97. He had a wicked, wicked slider, man. Now I look at these bullpens, and I'm not sure that anyone on our team or in that bullpen would even be on a team right now. I look at what the Braves did to eliminate the Dodgers with Matzik when he struck out the side in that critical seventh inning. <clears throat> anyway, 18 years ago, Yankee Stadium. We want to be a part of it. 
New York, New York. If you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere. They played that song after we won the World Series. I was standing on the field, having walked out of the clubhouse, drenched with champagne, looked around at the empty stadium, except for the post-game show that was going on on Fox, looked around, looked up at George Steinbrenner's box and said, see you later, Georgie. 18 years. So the Astros and Braves are preparing for the World Series. What do you do right now? I want to give you some behind the scenes of what's happening in the front office of both of those teams. Let's start on the business side. Believe it or not, the number one thing that is being worked on is tickets. It sounds totally crazy, but all tickets have to be distributed, sold, and you have to deal with all the people who want tickets. So Major League Baseball takes a selection of tickets for the World Series because each team gets an allocation. Believe it or not, the Dodgers get 20 seats to the World Series spread all around. The, they get upper deck. You get seats for your for your owner if you want them that are in the lower uh, deck in the lower bowl. There is the commissioner's suite, which he fills up with people. So if you're an owner or president and you want to go to the World Series, you sit with the commissioner. I had a chance and I called him up and said, hey, I want to go see the Royals in the World Series. So you just go and you can sit with Rob. But you have to map out where everybody, all the VIPs are sitting, all the politicians who want to go to games and you they have to buy their tickets because you can't give them gifts. All of the VIPs who want extra tickets, all the celebrities who want to come out, you're coordinating with Fox, you're coordinating with the with the league. So tickets is a big thing. You're then working on all of your in-game entertainment. You're working on the videos that are going to be shown, the hype-up videos. You're working with MLB because they control some of the in-between inning, uh, in-between inning promotions like Stand Up to Cancer or some of the other things that go on. But you're putting together your in-game presentation. You're also finalizing all the different parties you have to host. The team that hosts one, two and six and seven, which happens to be the Houston Astros. They throw World Series pre and post game parties on site. Every World Series team has to. The road team, four, five and six, three, four and five, excuse me. That's the Atlanta Braves. They are finalizing their venues, even though MLB gets. I got to do a quick detour here. Do you know that about 12 teams per year prepare their World Series party plan? Because even if there's a chance you're going to be in the World Series, like you're five games out of the wild card, you have to prepare a huge binder and submit it to Major League Baseball with not just what your ticket prices are going to be, which have to be approved, but also what your party plan is. So you're meeting with venues, you're making sure there's enough hotels for MLB and all of the VIP guests who come in for the World Series. So everyone is on pins and needles. As you get eliminated, you release the rooms, you release the venues, you move on. But as you make it deeper into the playoffs, you're paying deposits, you're getting the menu ready, you're doing the tastings, you're figuring out what the past hors d'oeuvres are going to be, and then you get eliminated, and then that's the end of it. But if you make it, then you immediately call. One of your first five calls is about the parties that have to get hosted. So that's going on. So it's a pretty busy time on the non-baseball side when you host a World Series. On the baseball side, Today is roster day. Today is workout day and roster day. Rosters mean that you have to choose 26 people to be on your World Series roster. You can only do replacements, and there have been a ton of replacements this year, only in case of injury, not lack of performance, not because you don't like matchups. There has to be an injury. So it is a game of chess when you are going through your roster. The way we did it is we had each name on a board of our 40-man roster, we had a list of who was on the roster for the division series against the Giants and the LCS against the Cubs. There are certain people who are definitely on your roster. You know exactly who your starters are sort of in, your, in, in the field. You're then making your rotation. You set up a World Series rotation before the first game is even played. It's not announced. So all we know is the game one matchup of Charlie Morton against Framber Valdez. So... Do you think that the Astros and Braves don't know who's pitching the rest of the series? Yes, it's completely done. They know game one, game two, game three. They know game four if it's a three-nothing series. They know game four if it's two to one. 
Then they know game five if it's three to one or one to three or two to two. We have every scenario mapped out of who's going to start what game given the score of the series, either in your favor or not in your favor. The reason why you do that is you don't want to let emotionality be a factor in what you're doing. Can things change during the course of a series? Absolutely. You can have injury. Lack of performance is not what changes the rotation. If Framber Valdez goes out and pitches one inning after pitching eight innings in last series game five, he will still pitch game five of the World Series. It's not even a wait to see. I promise you that's how it is. If Charlie Morton throws eight innings and is unhittable, they're not going to bring him back for game four. Even if they're down 3-0, he will pitch game five. So you go through and you're making your roster decisions, your rotation decisions, and then you call the owner. And you say, hey, this is what we're thinking. Are we good? You then have the manager give the information to the pitching coach. You then type up the roster. Now it's done in a computer. You submit the roster, but you don't hit send until the last possible second, which is tomorrow morning, the day of game one of the World Series, because you want to make sure everybody you put on that roster is ready to go. So we do a final check of each player right before you submit the roster. Hey, just checking. How you feeling? You ready to go? The other little nugget is we're also making the roster for the other team because we want to counter some decisions that we think are going to be made. Are they going to go left-handed hitting heavy on the bench? Therefore, we want to have as many lefties as possible. We know what they've done in the LCS and the LDS, but who are the people left off the roster who they could add and what impact would that have on our own roster decisions? So it's not just our roster. We're also doing the other team's roster. And guess what? You never get it right, ever, but you keep trying. World Series starts tomorrow. We will do a full preview tomorrow on the show. We'll give our pick on the show, not just for game one, but also for the series. I'm not going to give you my pick right now. You know who I'm picking, don't you? How could you not? March 31st, baby. All right, when we come back, we are going to tell you, we're going to talk a little bit about the Cardinals, and we are definitely going to talk about Tom Brady. Tom Brady, Mr. 600 man. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name is David Sampson. Thank you for spending a great month with us so far, a great two years with us so far. You've downloaded, you've rated, you've reviewed, you've followed. You've given me questions on Apple reviews that we've used in mailbag episodes. We've had phenomenal sit downs. At least I've enjoyed them. And I think you have too, based on the numbers. Thank you for making it through the gauntlet. We watch a movie every day. You knew I was going to watch Dune, and I did. Thank God I had time yesterday because the movie itself is two hours and 35 minutes, but I did a running time. A running time is when I hit play, and I don't do this often, but I do it when I suspect that I may not enjoy the movie or I may be distracted by life. And believe me, I was distracted yesterday. It took me seven hours and 20 minutes to watch Dune yesterday. 7.20. Or otherwise known as the length of a postseason baseball game. Zendaya is in it. Timothy Chalamet is in it. The guy from Mamma Mia is in it. Is it Stellar Skarsgård or the father? One of the scars guards. Javier Bardem is in it. You better look fast. Rebecca Ferguson from Reminisce with Hugh Jackman in the Mission Impossible movies. She's in it. Oscar Isaac from Scenes from a Marriage, the most violent year and other unbelievable ex machina great movies. He's in it. And here's what it's about. I have no idea. That movie was not for me. I'll tell you that. I didn't understand it. I didn't find it to be visually pleasing. Granted that I watched it on an iPad, it probably would have been better on a big screen. I kept waiting for some narration, some explanation. Maybe I'm the only one. All I know is that the end of the movie, 
was spectacular. The last line of dialogue is Zendaya looking at Timothy Chalamet with her blue eyes right into his oxygenated nose. Everyone there has to wear an oxygenated nose piece. I think it must be like Total Recall, where if you're on Mars, all of a sudden your skull starts showing and you melt when you're in the desert. The last line of the movie, this is only the beginning. And I said, no. I thought in the beginning when it said Dune Part 1, I thought that was a joke. Like they're just calling it Part 1 the way the Zucker brothers would have. But there's got to be a Part 2. Because she said this is only the beginning. Well, for me, it was the end. Sometime this morning, before you hear this podcast, there's going to be a hiring of Major League Baseball. Off days are the days announcements can be made in baseball when you're making a managerial change or a free agent signing. Not that there's a, the only one you can sign right now would be your own player. Because other teams' players don't become free agents until six days after the last game of the World Series. But the St. Louis Cardinals are going to hire a manager. Get ready. You've heard of him. They went big time. They went veteran manager, $10 million a year. Unbelievable that they made this deal. His name is Oliver Marmol. Ever heard of him? Today, he will become the youngest manager in Major League Baseball at 35 years old. Today, he will become the manager of at least two players older than he in Yadier Molina and Adam Wainwright. He is the former bench coach under Mike Schilt. Anyone surprised that the philosophical Phyllis cut that, Coca? Come on, get your mouth going on money. I got to do my mouth exercises. Here we go. Okay. 14. Nine, six. Is anyone surprised that the Cardinals fired their manager for philosophical differences? And instead of going with an experienced known commodity, they went with their bench coach who's 35 years old, who I promise you will never have philosophical differences with the front office, who I promise you is so happy to have a job as manager and to be promoted from bench coach that when he gets the lineup given to him every day, when he's told which coaches to hire and fire, when he's told which players he's going to have and how to use them, do you know what his reaction will be? Hey, no problem, man. Thanks for the per diem. Ali Marmo will be announced as the manager. And the way that they're going to get around this ridiculous appointment of him as manager. Wait till you watch the press conference. There was never a doubt that Marmo was ready to be a manager. As a matter of fact, Mike Schultz himself knew that Marmo was being groomed to be the next manager of the Cardinals. We couldn't be more pleased at his leadership style or his ability to lead this team back to its rightful place in the World Series. I've written these press releases before these statements. I've delivered these statements before at the dais in front of the media, and it's always a bunch of crap. All right, Coca, give me some music, please. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. You know what I want. So you want to talk to Samson. So that is a segment that we do based on a movie called Half Baked, if you're new to the show. Half Baked is a movie about people getting baked, which is legal in many of the states where you live. So I'd strongly suggest it. Watch the movie. There's a character named Samson. Ask me a question at Twitter, David P. Samson, in my DMs, which are still open to the public. Doesn't it make you crazy when DMs are closed so you feel like you can't reach someone? But then you send a DM and you don't get a response and you're like, what an A-H. What an asshat. I try to answer as many as I can. I promise. I really do. As a matter of fact, my absolute addiction to the phone indicates that I answer way more than most from what I've heard from people who know these things. Here's the question today. Are you aware that Tom Brady threw his 200th touchdown? Yes, I am. I'm not sure why this person said 200, because I think what he meant was 600. What are you going to offer for that ball? And did that fan get screwed? Normally, I wouldn't read the word screwed. Yeah, I would. Thank you for that question. For those of you who don't know the story, Tom Brady is a 
pitcher. <laughs> Tom Brady is a quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tom Brady has been playing for 50 years. Tom Brady threw his 600th TD pass to a receiver named Mike Evans. 600 is the record by far. Aaron Rodgers is the next active leader at 400 and what, 27 or something, Coca? Tom Brady is obviously the GOAT, throws the 600th TD pass. The wide receiver catches it, which was, if go look at the replay, the catch that he made was unbelievable. Throws the ball into the stands to the first row or second row. They don't actually throw it like a baseball. And that's the end of the play. Normal happens, souvenir, everyone goes home happy. All of a sudden, the bench is yelling, no, no. This happens in baseball when a, uh, a home run, the first career home run by a rookie gets hit into the stands and someone catches it. This happens when there's a milestone, some milestone, your hundredth home run. Believe me, we look for any milestone. And then there is a oh, little detour, Coca. Do you know that every baseball team has an assigned handwriting uh, um, authority? There's a better way to describe that. We had our assistant trainer named Mike Kozak. He was responsible to write on all of the balls that were meaningful and what record was matched or attained or gotten. So he'd write on the ball, Tom Brady, 600th TD. But in baseball. So the bench in Tampa and the front office is aware before a game about milestones that could happen during the course of that game. We would speak to the manager and the coaching staff and the ball boys and the clubhouse people. Everyone would be made aware of something that could be happening in that game. That is either from our side or from the visiting side. Now you'd ask, how would we know what the visiting team, what their milestones are? That's because PR people communicate with each other. The head of PR for the Buccaneers and the head of PR. Who did the Buccaneers play, Coca? I'm completely blanking on who they played last yesterday. I think they played the Saints, but that doesn't sound right. The Bears. The Buccaneers played the Bears. Thank you. So they crushed the Bears, by the way. So what happens is PR people communicate for each team, and you're aware of what's happening that particular day, who the rookies are, if they're in the lineup, who the rookies are on the roster, whether or not they've hit their first home run, whether or not they're going to get their 30th stolen base and be the first player in team history to have 20 home runs and 30 stolen bases as a second baseman, whatever the case may be, if it's a stolen base, the visiting team would say to the home team, is there any way we could get that base? And we would give it to them. We would remove that base from playing between innings and give it to the other team. If it's a ball that is not given to the state into the stands, we would, go and retrieve it from the bullpen or wherever it was and give it to the other team or keep it if it's ours for our milestone. When it is a huge milestone and we know we're going to have a problem getting the ball back if it lands in the stands, we will speak to the team in advance like I did with Ken Griffey when he hit his, no coincidence, 600th home run at Pro Player Stadium. And I entered into a negotiation to try to get back that ball. I was unsuccessful because that man wanted to sell that ball and pay for his kid's college or pay for his kid's house. I think it was his kid's college. But you do your best. So the 600th ball is thrown. Mike Evans catches it, flips it up. The bench says, no, no, we need that ball. You send over someone from the training staff to get the ball back. And the person says no, or the person says yes. Meanwhile, the front office president of the team is calling down to the sideline saying, get that ball. They then report back, he won't give the ball until we give him something, we have to make a trade. I am then getting this involved, it's not micro, I'm getting involved with what we are willing to offer. And you were asking me, what would I offer for Tom Brady's 600th home run ball, touchdown ball? I am offering not just a signed Tom Brady jersey, which he will sign no problem to get the ball back. I'm also offering another ball used during that game signed by Tom Brady because that's at the, that's the bottom line you want things signed by Tom Brady i'm then offering a meet and greet with Tom Brady and that's where i stop i'm creating a memory with a photo i am creating a framed memory by giving a jersey 
And believe me, there's we have many jerseys. Football teams have many jerseys. And that's it. That would be enough to get someone to give that ball back. Darren Ravel, among others, reported that that ball could have been worth half a million dollars. I question that significantly. Because before we have milestone events take place, we are also getting an understanding of the market. Now, granted, the memorabilia market may be totally off the charts right now. Maybe people are so insane about Tom Brady that they would pay half a million dollars for his 600th touchdown pass. It's not like it's his last touchdown pass. It's a milestone for sure, but it's a number. 601 becomes the record next week, although he may have gotten to 601 even yesterday. I don't even know. If someone wants $500,000 or comes back at a number in cash, I am a no every time, unless it's other people's cash. I was very happy to offer cash that the Reds would pay. The reason why I don't want to offer cash for that type of memorabilia is once you get into that negotiation, you realize that it's not an actual fan. And fans are the only people that I can take advantage of because I'm taking advantage of their emotional attachment to the team. That's why I'm offering meet and greets because that is worth more than half a million dollars or pictures or jerseys because you're giving someone a lifetime story with proof behind it. You give someone $100,000 or $50,000, it's gone. They don't have the story. How is it possible that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers got away with giving a $1,000 gift card to their team store? Here's a little secret. Don't ever take gift cards from any restaurant, from any store. Because by definition, the reason why you get those gift cards is 98 out of 100 people will spend more than the gift card. And they would not have otherwise spent any money going into that team store. But you've got the gift card. So you're like, I got to use it. And then once you're there, oh, I'm going to get that, that. Oh, it's $30 over. No problem. I'm getting all this stuff for $30. That's sort of how you view it. But the way the team views it is, hey, that's a $30 sale more than we would have gotten. And our margins on retail are so big that the juice is way worth the squeeze in that deal. So the Tampa Bay Bucks offering a $1,000 gift card is a joke. How this fan did not hold out for more is beyond me. It is so great when teams can take advantage like that. They totally did the wrong thing, by the way. Totally. Thanks for the question. We had three picks this weekend. I think the Texans covered versus the Cardinals. They were getting 70 points. So we took the Texans plus 70, the Deshaun Watson Texans. So that was a loss. They were only getting 17 and a half against the Cardinals. Saturday, I thought Clemson would put it together against Pitt. Didn't happen. They didn't cover. That's two underdogs who didn't cover. That's two losses. But Friday, we told you the Astros would beat the Red Sox. And they did. We are 137 and 124. I've got two interesting picks right now that I want to give you, and I want to segue into the next topic. There's a football game tonight, Thursday night football. It's the Russell Wilsons against the Drew Breeses, Seahawks versus Saints. For whatever reason, the Seahawks are getting four points, and I like it. The Saints are a far cry from a good team. Seahawks plus four. The NBA is underway. If you've been paying attention, there's so much sports right now. I would understand if you don't know the Florida Panthers are undefeated. I would understand if you didn't know that the Knicks lost to the Magic last night, which was embarrassing. I understand if you weren't aware that Ty Lue is still the coach of the Clippers or that Kawhi Leonard hasn't played a minute for them yet. The Trailblazers are playing the Clippers. The Trailblazers have Damon Lillard, the top 75 guy. Take the Trailblazers. Get the points against the Clippers. Seahawks, I'm taking two dogs. Seahawks, Trailblazers. But that's not what I want to talk about in the NBA. Did you see the on-bench public fight that took place with the Lakers? The Lakers with LeBron James, Anthony Davis, 275 members. Russell Westbrook, 375 members. Carmelo Anthony, four members of the 75 that is over 5% of the best 75 players of all time are on one team. 
Dwight Howard should have made it five. Biggest snub of all time, Dwight Howard not making it. Well, there was a fight on the bench of the Laker game this weekend. Anthony Davis and Dwight Howard got into it physically. Had to be restrained by teammates. And baseball in the dugout, we see it from time to time. Sidelines in football, they're all amped up and juiced up. They've got pads on. You'll see some screaming, some pushing, some shoving. Not very often on an NBA bench. What would be causing the Lakers to have a fight on the bench? The Lakers, who had a horrible preseason, a difficult start to the regular season. LeBron James, who is not a spring chicken, but desperate for a title. Carmelo Anthony, who's not a spring chicken, more desperate for a title. Russell Westbrook, not a fall chicken, also titleless, trying to build his place in the pantheon of NBA superstars. The combination is difficult at best when you are a coach. You need your best player, LeBron James, to somehow take charge of that clubhouse. We know LeBron James is involved in personnel decisions. Obviously, that's why Carmelo Anthony is a Laker. Although he did have a good game last night or the night before. Maybe it was last night. But we know LeBron James is making decisions. When you are going to make personal decisions, when you wear shorts and a tank top for a living, you better make sure that you are taking care of your off-court stuff. The way it gets dismissed publicly is never how it is in real life. Remember when Machado and Tatis had that big argument in the dugout and then they went on Sports Center on CBS, whatever they went three days later and they professed their love for each other, their father-son relationship, how great it is as a team. Of course, they didn't win again after that. They fired their manager, they fired their farm director and the Padres are an abject disaster. But what they always say is, hey, this was good. That's what we would say publicly. Page two of the Our Team is Fighting handbook is this is what happens when people care. This is what happens during the emotion of a game, the intensity of a game. We, I'm on number four, will grow from this. We'll come together. We had a moment of great clarity. That's what you make sure the players all say. And believe me, that's exactly what the players said in this case after the fight. But here's a little surprise for you. The Lakers are a mess and it's going to cost Frank Vogel his job. Wait to see is when I tell you something's going to happen. And when it does, I revisit it. When it doesn't, I revisit it. Wait to see for today is Frank Vogel if he does not make the NBA Finals. He has to win the Western Conference or Frank Vogel will lose his job because LeBron James will be so frustrated with another losing season, ringless season. And by the way, they're not going to win a ring. You wait to see. And you know I'm going to revisit some old ones. The March 31st one we revisited in the beginning of the show. March 31st, 2021, Braves over the Yankees in the World Series. We're almost there. A month earlier, though, on February 8th, 2021, I said to you before the season started, after they traded Bauer and all the talk was about them repeating, I said the Dodgers will not win the World Series in 2021. That's a yes. They did not win the World Series. When you think about going back to the wait to see for today and give you one more minute of where my head is on that. The NBA is suffering from this concept of player empowerment, as you know, where players are making decisions, players are deciding where they're going to play. Coaches have become so unbelievably neutered that it is the same as managers in baseball, but for a totally different reason. It's not that analytics and basketball have taken over what plays to call when. Certainly the front office gets involved in rotations and minutes and setting up whether you're going to play the triangle offense or what you're going to do. But coaches have become so far less important in the NBA. Take a look at huddles and who's talking during huddles, who's listening during huddles. 
Take a look at the assistant coaches who are now offensive assistant coaches, defensive assistant coaches, putting in plays that sometimes players are paying attention to, sometimes they're not. And you will realize why it is that NBA coaches are going to be fired as quickly as they're going to be now, why they're not finishing out their contracts, why players are getting sick of them faster. It all comes back down to the empowerment. For those players, it's just business. See you later, coach. It's nothing personal. 